The uncertainty of our lives can be terrifying when faced with life-altering decisions. We sometimes feel that God could never bring good out of the situation we're in, so we fear and we tremble. This was not St. John Bosco's attitude. He knew that God would provide for him in his bold plans for his oratory school for boys. He behaved fearlessly with a conviction that only can be found in those who seek to do the right thing. In today's story, I want to show you how a saint acts when no one believes in him and is abandoned by everyone, simply for trying to accomplish his God-given mission. You're watching The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. When word spread of the severe difficulties arising at every turn to run Don Bosco's work aground, several of his friends, instead of helping him to persevere, started suggesting that he give up his enterprise. Don Bosco seemed always concentrated on the oratory, as if unable to detach himself from his boys. He visited them several times a week to check on their work, watched over them at feasts with more than paternal solicitude, and always gathered new ones off the streets. He continuously appeared in public squares amid a crowd of street brats and spoke with every one of them very often. Seeing all that, Don Bosco's friends began seriously to fear he was seized by monomania, an obsessive enthusiasm for or preoccupation with one thing. Some of his fellow disciples from the seminary and boarding school tried to advise him to change his methods of apostolate. You see, they told him, you are compromising the priestly character. How so, Don Bosco replied, with your extravagances, by lowering yourself to participate in games with so many brats and allowing them to accompany you with so many irreverent shouts. These things, never seen in Turin, are contrary to the old habits of our grave and reserved clergy. Without wasting words, Don Bosco signaled that their logic did not persuade him. They repeated among themselves, his mind is going, he no longer reasons. One day, Father Sebastiano Pacchiotti and the incomparable theologian Borel, who fully agreed with Don Bosco's ideas, visited him and offered him a compromise. Dear Don Bosco, the theologian entreated, to avoid exposing ourselves to the danger of losing the whole operation, we had better save it, at least in part. Let us wait for times more favorable to accomplish our plans and give leave of absence to the oratory boys, retaining only about 20 younger ones. As we privately continue taking care of these few, God will open the way for us to do more by providing us with means and a suitable place. Don Bosco replied, standing his ground, no, never. The Lord has begun this work in his mercy and must finish it. You know how much pain it took to snatch such a great number of young men from the path of evil and how well they're responding to us. Therefore, I do not find it fitting to abandon them again to themselves and the world's dangers, with serious harm to their souls. But where do we house them in the meantime? asked the theologian. At the oratory, Don Bosco replied simply. Where, pray, is this oratory? I see it, already built. A church, a house, and an enclosure for recreation. It already exists, and I see it. And where are all these things? The good theologian asked. I cannot yet say where they are, Don Bosco added, but they certainly do exist. I see them and they will be ours. Hearing these words as he recounted this episode to Salesian veterans many years later, the theologian Burrell felt deeply moved. He saw Don Bosco's assertions as sure proof of his madness and exclaimed, my poor Don Bosco has truly lost his mind. Unable to bear his immense sorrow, he approached Don Bosco, kissed him, and left, shedding bitter tears. Father Pacchiotti also gave him a look of compassion, saying, Poor Don Bosco, and withdrew sorrowfully. Some venerable priests of the diocese went to visit him. He welcomed them with the utmost respect. 
They tried to show him how he could do souls great good by exercising other offices of the sacred ministry, as preaching missions to the people, assisting parish priests around the city, or devoting himself entirely to other charitable works. Don Bosco listened to them in silence. For a moment, they thought that they had succeeded in persuading him and said, you must not remain obstinate. Divine providence cannot do the impossible and seemingly indicates that it disapproves of the work that it has begun. That's a sacrifice, but it must be made. Dismiss your young men. Don Bosco interrupted with his hands raised to heaven, his gaze shining with extraordinary splendor. Oh, divine providence. Then he looked to his dissenters and said, you're mistaken. I'm far from unable to maintain the oratory. Mind you, divine providence has sent me these children and I will not reject even one of them. I have the invincible certainty providence will provide me with everything they need. Indeed, the means are already prepared. Since no one wants to rent me a room, I will build one with Mary Most Holy's help. We'll have vast edifices, many rooms for schools and dormitories, capable of receiving as many young people as will come. We'll have workshops of all kinds so the young men can learn a trade according to their inclination. We'll have a beautiful courtyard and a spacious porch for recreation. Finally, we'll have a magnificent church, clerics, catechists, assistants, art teachers, and professors ready to join us. Numerous priests will instruct the children and take special care of those who show a religious vocation. Stunned at his unexpected answer and looking at one another in disbelief, the gentleman said, Do you want to form a new religious community then? And what if I had this project? Don Bosco replied. But, but what uniform will you assign to your religious? Virtue, replied Don Bosco, unwilling to explain his thoughts in greater detail. After leaving Don Bosco's room, they concluded, we now understand his mental faculties are unbalanced. Don Bosco spoke as he did because he was sure that events would justify his words and ardent desires. Indeed, he had narrated his dreams to Father Cafasso from the very beginning, asking for his advice. The holy priest answered, I believe all this is for the greater glory of God and the good of souls. So go ahead, attaching importance to these dreams with your whole soul. Looking back now with the advantage of time, it's absurd to hear that people actually doubted St. John Bosco's mission to establish an oratory school for boys. In fact, to some Catholics, that's all they know him for today. Can you imagine how terrible it would have been if he had given up? But he advanced in his plans, trusting in God to get him through. It would clear up so much sorrow and pain in our own lives if we would just do the same and have confidence in God's plans for us. I used to be a full-time custodian of the Fatima statue and would take her around to different families to pray the rosary. At that time, for whatever reason, I was assailed with many troubles, no doubt straight from the father of lies himself. And I still remember how I went to mass and heard the gospel where our Lord says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And immediately upon hearing that gospel that I had heard a thousand times before, somehow all of my problems began to disappear. And I invite you now to be like St. John Bosco and trust in divine providence. Though all may seem lost at the moment, confidence. Thank you all so much for watching, and please be sure to subscribe so that next Friday you can hear part two of the story, where Don Bosco outsmarts the workers of an insane asylum. Our Lady of Confidence, pray for us.